Oh, praise the Lord. Thank you, Jonathan. Uh, I think you can detect a theme here this morning. We've been singing and, and speaking here of God's good creation. That portion there out of Proverbs, many see as Christ, who is wisdom, who was with and in the, with the Father as the triune God brought forth creation. And what is the response of those who are the created, uh, created in God's image as it were. Uh, in this portion of scripture, we're going to be in Romans, keep your, keep your Bibles open with you, but we come on Sunday mornings to worship the Lord, the living God. Worship, as we looked at creation, uh, we are created in God's image and we are worshiping people. And you'll either worship God or you'll worship creation, we're going to see today. But Noah Webster explains worship this way. Uh, worship as a noun is worth and ship. The state of worth or worthiness. Excellence of character, dignity, worth, worthiness. And of course, chiefly we're talking there about who is of most worth. It is God the creator. It is God, uh, three in one, Father, Son, and Holy Spirit. This triune God is he that is most worthy of worship, chiefly and eminently the act of paying divine honors to this supreme being. Um, worship, again, to adore, to pay divine honors, to reverence with supreme respect and veneration, to perform aspects of adoration. Jesus would say, but the hour is coming, and now is, when the true worshipers will worship the Father in spirit and in truth, for the Father is seeking such to worship him. Bottom line is, folks, we all worship. We all either worship God, or we are idolaters. When we're talking here in, uh, in Romans, we're talking about those that are bent towards God, being made to worship God, being redeemed, those who are, are not saved, they're automatically idolaters. And in the interim, we want to though see that as far as worship goes, we, as we learned this morning in Sunday school, we have a tendency as fallen man, even as redeemed, to be drawn away after the creation and not worship the creator as we ought. So I want to think today a little bit about what man's largest asset or man's largest problem is. And it really is, where's our heart? And where are we, where, where's our worship uh, directed? So open, let me give you a little bit of a review here. Let's go have Romans open. And we know the letter to the Romans uh, that Paul has written, it opens up in verse one there, that it's about the gospel of God. It's about the gospel of God concerning his son, Jesus Christ. This, this, this uh, God-man, 100% God and 100% man. And as we go forward, we're going to see, of course, that Jesus was involved in creation, and he as Redeemer is involved in recreation. But the idea there in, is the fact that God has called us to be his beloved, the beloved of God through the gospel. So, so the, the whole main theme, though, of Romans is not the theme of sin, although we would think it is because we've been here in Romans chapter 1, 18 and following up to chapter 3, 20. It seems like it's all about sin. But really the whole uh, theme of this letter is about gospel. Verse 14 says, I am a debtor both to the Greeks and to the barbarians, both to the wise and the unwise. So as much as in me, I'm ready to preach the gospel to you who are in Rome. He goes on to say that he's not ashamed of the gospel of Christ, verse 16, for it is the power of God to salvation to everyone who believes. And then here we are in this portion of scripture. And I just want to give you a quick overview and, and the background because we've not been in this again for another couple weeks. Uh, but two weeks ago, here in Romans chapter 1, 18 to 32, I touched on the idea that in this portion, God uh, is, is turning them over, it says. God gave them up. God gave them up. God gave them over. This idea of judgment that is upon man. But the judgment that God has turned them over to, the unrighteousness that man walks in and lives in, is a direct 
direct result of where their heart is and what they are worshiping in, in truth. And the real problem is that they are ungodly and they worship, as we'll find, the creation rather than the creator. Exchanging the truth for the lie comes at a very high price. But when I spoke a couple weeks ago, I recognized that in, in, in comparing impurity to the purity we looked at in Ephesians, we know that the outworking of these folks who worship the creation is that they live ungodly, immoral, impure lives. And I touched quite a bit on that, so I don't want to touch more on that. But I want to, though, get at the at really the, the crux of the problem, or what is exactly the main root problem that man has. And I believe the main root problem is that man is a worshiping being. Uh, in worshiping creation, his worship has been perverted. And it's really who we are in response to God, wrongly, that then brings all of what would follow. But right here at the base of this text here, verse 25, I think is very instructive for us. It lays out what exactly the problem is with man. Even going all the way back to the garden, God created us and we owed him worship. And we'll see as we look at, uh, there in, in Romans, it says that very clearly. The idea that man has repressed the truth and unrighteousness. And instead of giving glory to God and thanks, they worship the creation rather than the creator. So let me just read this portion of text, and we'll get a little bit into it. It's pretty hot, uh, so let's stand. See if I can't keep you all awake here this morning. So stand for the reading of this portion of God's word. I want to really see in this portion that exchanging the truth for the lie comes at a high price. And my focus will be verse 25. That's Romans chapter 1. 18 to 25. For the wrath of God is revealed from heaven against all ungodliness and unrighteousness of men who suppress the truth in unrighteousness, because what may be known of God is manifest in them, for God <coughs> has shown it to them. For since the creation of the world, his invisible attributes are clearly seen, being understood by the things that are made, even his eternal power and Godhead, so that they are without excuse, because although they knew God, they did not glorify him as God, nor were thankful, but became futile in their thoughts, and their foolish hearts were darkened. Professing to be wise, they became fools and changed the glory of the incorruptible God into an image made like corruptible man and birds and four-footed animals and creeping things. Therefore also God gave them up to uncleanness in the lusts of their hearts to dishonor their bodies among themselves who exchanged the truth of God for the lie and worshiped and served the creature rather than the creator who is blessed forever. Amen. Let's pray. Father God, we thank you for your word, for your revelation, Lord. We thank you for your goodness and mercy to us. Lord, that we sit here today, uh, many, most all of us, under your grace, being delivered out of incredible darkness into light so that we might truly be able to see you, our creator and our redeemer. But Father, may we, as we look at this and we see the brokenness of man, the, the despair that rests upon man in this world who worship creation rather than you, and that they fall into all sorts of diverse troubles, that Father, we might be encouraged, Lord, be warned, but be encouraged that we might worship you who are creator and who is most blessed forever. So bless our time together. Help me, Father, I pray, to be able to share my heart and to open these scriptures in such a way that we might be more conformed into your image, Father. In Jesus' name, amen. You may be seated. So I thought we'd spend a little bit more time. I really feel as though I got ahead of myself just a little bit to go right into the judgments of God without burying a little deeper into verse 25. This idea of the lie, those that worship and serve the creature. 
Uh, and then point two, I'll look at the truth, worship and serve, service of the Creator. But verse 25 there you say, see, who exchanged the truth of God for the lie and worshiped and served the creature rather than the Creator. Romans 1.18 and following lays out what this great exchange looks like. What man has turned over and turned into. Instead of the glorious uh, worship of God, his creator, we worship creation. We live in God's world, and, and, and we, but we don't worship the God who's created that world. We worship and live underneath our means by worshiping creation meaning those, these folks who are fallen. Uh, man is created by God, but instead uh, they suppress that truth, it says, in unrighteousness. Again, I think this whole time here, Paul preaching to this pagan Roman uh, context is very much the majority context of what we find ourselves living in today. So it's very, very instructive for us to see why is the world the way it is? And I think at the, at the bulk of it, the, all the sin we see, all the struggle we see of these judgments of God start at this foundational mistake, is that folks don't worship God, the creator, they worship the creation. And Paul has been very clearly laying that out for us. They suppress the truth in, in, in unrighteousness. The truth is God. The truth is God, the creator. We see over and over here, you look in verse 20, for since the creation of the world, his invisible attributes are clearly seen, being understood by the things that are made. These folks can not only see that God is creator from all that's made, see the wonder and the power, but even in their hearts, God has put a knowledge of him as creator, but they reject that. Verse 21 says, although they knew God, they did not glorify him as God, nor were thankful, but became futile in, your thoughts, in their thoughts. You see right there is very much what verse 25 is saying. They have repressed that truth, and instead of living as God's creatures in God's world, giving glory to God, and living thankfully, they're turned over to futility. You can't be God's creation and live in his good creation and not worship him and not have big, big trouble. And that is the crux, really, of man's problem. And verse 22 and 23 really makes it ever so clear. Professing to be wise, they became fools and changed the glory of the incorruptible God into an image made like corruptible man and birds and four-footed animals and creeping things. There you have it. This great exchange really is a right con conception of God. It, it's really a right understanding of who they are as creation and who God is as creator. And if you have that foundational truth warped, then it leads to everything else we see here following in Romans chapter 1. The very things in creation that God gave for man to rule over. Look at that text. If you see those things, they became fools. They changed the glory of the incorruptible God. Look at, and, and, and birds and four-footed animals and creeping things. In the creation story, that's the creation mandate. God makes man in his glorious image and then causes, tells them to be fruitful, multiply, and take dominion. Rule over all of God's creation. Here, though, when man gets worship out of whack and starts worshiping creation, instead of ruling, he himself finds himself subject to these things. He now worships the creation. This ends up being the worst exchange ever. Man created in the glorious image of God, made to rule, now is ruled by the very creation. You see how hopeless and helpless this really is. And that's where, where you see what proceeded from that, that I preached a couple weeks ago. Therefore, man is given to vile passions. God the Creator made them male and female to do all these things. Instead, it is a uh, distortion of who they are as created man. God has good creation, man, woman, and instead, this whole idea of giving themselves to women with women and men with men, the, the homosexual lifestyle, is really their hatred for God, their creator, worked out in how they live in these vile passions. 
But the problem is that those vile passions, although they are, and they're given over to them, the crux of the problem is that man in his fallen state worships the creation rather than the creator. So again, I won't go any deeper into that. We were able to really go quite deep a couple weeks ago and see how this whole idea of um, really the impurity of, of the way men and women conduct themselves in this world outside of God is, is, is just a repudiation of who God is as a creator. Maybe instead of really telling you much more about that part there, Peter Jones, who I quoted a couple weeks ago, says this in his book, Who's Rainbow, summarizing the problem we have there with the illicit life, those who reject God. The, the sacrament of creation idolatry is really what it is. The deep significance of this issue draws out in the work of Richard Hayes, professor at Duke Divinity School, who posits that the people's, the, excuse me, who posits that the apostle portrayed, portrays homosexual behavior as a sacrament, so to speak, or an anti-religion of human beings who refuse to honor God as their creator. When human beings engage in homosexual activity, they enact an outward and visible sign of an inward spiritual reality, the rejection of the creator's good design. Homosexuality is, a, is particularly a graphic image of the distortion of creation. You see that? Uh, so that, that pretty much summarized my sermon a couple weeks ago. Because man, in his fallen state, is worshiping creation, now everything his, he does is distorted, and in particular, his relationships are distorted. This greatest exchange, the living a lie, I can't help but see that living a lie in the, in the King James, it says the lie. It reminds us and brings us again right back to the garden. Man created uh, uh, in God's image, but then the lie. And this is where this fallenness and drags us down. As we look through Romans here, the idea there at the beginning that uh, against all ungodliness, they suppress the truth, and, and the man's main and chief problem is ungodliness. What ungodliness is, is rejecting God part and parcel, rejecting God as creator. And I, I think what I've been trying to say as I looked into those things, it says that the, the law of God is written on man's heart. And as we see here, this portion here is talking about man before the law at Sinai ever came. But the law, the law that will come at Sinai is on the heart of man. And that first uh, table of the law makes it clear, man as creation, we should have no other gods before him. We shouldn't make carved images. You should not take the name of the Lord your God in vain. Remember the Sabbath day to keep it holy. Godliness is simply honoring God as creator God, not having idolatry, which is what they fall into. Uh, <laughs> illustrations are difficult, but, but man created in the image of God is meant to live in his world in worship and humility to God so that he might live rightly. We wouldn't pull up to the gas station and put diesel fuel in our uh, gasoline tanks. It's not going to run. Thank goodness they make it so big that you can't put it in. I think I've tried before. So. Um, we're not going to walk around and wear our pants backwards. If we do, they just don't quite fit right. The pants are meant to be worn a certain way. And honestly, though, man is created in God's image is meant to live a certain way. But that's where you see is the rejection of God. What now you see is people not just wearing their pants backwards, but pretending they're not even men or women. Not even understanding who they are is God's good creation, is man and woman. Instead of marriage being rightly lived out and glorified, we see all types of perversions. This very idea of living in God's world, worshiping the creation other than the creator, leads to a, a rampant idolatry in our culture. Verse 28 puts it this way. And even as they did not like to retain God in their knowledge, God gave them over to a debased mind to do those things which are not fitting. And you see what is at the head of it. They do not like to retain God 
in their knowledge. Man, rightly related to God, is supposed to retain God in his, in his knowledge. Not just retain God in his knowledge, but worship God and worship God rightly. So what you have in, in worshiping uh, the creation is a, a serious um, distortion of what man is and who he should be. The fallenness of man is worked out in these ways where it says God turning man over. Man living in God's world apart from truly honoring him as, as God would lend itself that to look at verse 29 and 30. This is what man turns into. Being filled with all unrighteousness, sexual immorality, wickedness, covetousness, maliciousness, full of envy, murder, strife, deceit, evil-mindedness, they are work, whisperers, backbiters, haters of God. Very simply, folks, they don't love God, they hate God, and they will not love their neighbor, they hate their neighbor. Do you see here in what Paul is saying, that second table of the law, murder, um, uh, malicious, covetousness, wickedness, and the very last part there, haters of God. And look at verse 30, violent, proud, boasters, inventors of evil things, disobedient to parents. It's the second table of the law. We ought to honor our father and mother. We ought not to murder or to steal. We ought not to covet or to commit adultery. But because these folks are so have so turned their hearts toward God, not that they have a choice, but we do see in this portion of scripture that they're guilty that they do know and should honor and worship God, but they don't. And this is the very fact of how they walk out and live in horrific ways. It's very simply living in God's world, but living in opposition to him, worshiping creation other than God, and this is what you turn into, undiscerning, unworthy, unloving, unforgiving, unmerciful. They can't help themselves. They don't have a choice but to live in that type of sin because of their fallenness. This is man's natural state apart from Christ. I can't help but think about these folks that worship creation rather than the creator, and they're just destined. Now, maybe not to live like we talked this morning, man is totally depraved, but maybe not as depraved as he could be. But this is a list that, that folks act like. Thank goodness you don't normally have one person with all of that list at once. But man is depraved. Man is totally depraved. He can't help himself. Uh, this week, you know, we love our Yogi and our Lucy. And Lucy now is no longer a little puppy. She's grown into a woman dog. And we're trying to make sure she and Yogi don't have puppies. And Yogi is doing all he can. He would just about go through a wall to get to Lucy, and it's just torturous for us. But don't you see, this is what man is, who are given to the creation, who won't worship their God. They have no hope but to live in these ways, in God's world, which is directly in opposition to God. Verse 32, who knowing the righteous judgment of God, that those who practice such things are deserving of death not only do the same, but also approve of those who practice them. It's contagious. Idolatry is contagious. Not only do they want to reject God and hate God, they want everybody to hate God with them. And it is a bad state of affairs. That type of culture is a culture of death. And we see it everywhere. But, uh, but, but Paul in laying this condition in the world that he lived in, we, as I said, see the same brokenness, but I want to see, though, even in this little portion of scripture, that the hope for man, the hope, as I said a couple weeks ago, for, for fallen men who have given themselves to, to homosexuality and, and transsexualism and all that ridiculousness, that the gospel is the power to save. That's the very foundation of this book. The gospel is the power of God unto salvation, of which Paul is not ashamed. Even in this little portion here, we see Paul himself 
who was uh, uh, so miraculously converted that even as he's telling us about man in this condition, he flows in to worship. He flows in to worship the, the creator, it says there, who is blessed forever. So as we look at what man is, worshiping creation and fall in, those of us here who have been touched by the gospel, see, here's the deal. If you worship creation, you will of necessity then serve these vile ways of living. But if the gospel has so changed us, we will, instead of worshiping the creation, we will worship the creator and serve him. So the truth uh, that God is creator is, is what I just want to encourage us in here today. As we move forward, we're going to see from where this book started and where we're headed, the, the amazing power of the gospel of Jesus Christ. That, that these types of folks, there is hope. We were all, as we saw last week, some of these folks. We all had our time of living like this, but God through Christ has saved us, has delivered us, if we've repented of our sins and trusted in Christ. That is the power of the gospel that we saw in Romans chapter 1, 3, and 4, that it's the gospel of God concerning the, the Lord Jesus Christ, who was born of the seed of David, this Lord Jesus Christ who became a man. This, like, why would God even allow all this? We're talking this morning about sin, and why would sin enter the world? But I can tell you that it's for a good purpose, because God the Creator, the Son, then takes upon himself the form of man, the Creator of heaven and earth, enters into his own creation so that he might recreate man in his own image. So as much as we were fallen, now we're made right. Now we can worship, we can serve God rightly. Jesus, who is this second person of the Trinity, took upon himself, as I said, flesh and bone, so that he might restore us to right worship as our creator. Uh, Peter Jones, one more time, in this one little sentence, and, and just look in this one sentence, there's so much, you know, I thought about it, it's only bad. I mean, it's only bad. Look at it. They, they, the whole culmination of that is they give themselves to worship the creation, and, and then all of God turns them over, God turns them over, God turns them over. But Paul, in this one little text, shares with us what's really right. It's right that we worship the creator. So Jones says the same thing. In one sentence, Paul defines the only two religious systems available to human beings throughout all time and space. We worship and serve either the creation, nature, in a thousand different ways, or the eternal creator who is blessed forever. And this book, as we're going to go forward, Paul is laying out how dark sin is, how, how deeply uh, flawed and broken man is, how, fall, how, how far man has fallen. But we'll get to chapter 5 and we'll say, where sin abounded, grace did all, much, all the more abound. We would have never known the mercy and the grace and the love of God, his long suffering, if there weren't sin in the world. That's what brought Christ into the world. So, and it doesn't, you know, what is, what is the wonderful part about the gospel? Again, is it, is it the creator himself has entered creation? Colossians 1, 13 to 17 can't explain it any more beautifully. You've, and I bring this up again because the gospel is the power of God unto salvation. And, it, it, and then recognizing that he who saves is the creator himself. So if you want to turn quickly to Colossians 1, 13 to 17, I want to show you this because I think it's wonderful. I think it bears repeating. I kind of touched on it a little bit when we started to open up the book of Romans. Starting in verse 13, he has delivered us from the power of darkness and conveyed us into the kingdom of the son of his love, in whom we have redemption through his blood, the forgiveness of sins. That's the gospel in a nutshell, that we are delivered out of that type of darkness, that type of idolatry, and translated into the kingdom of his son, that our sins are forgiven. And we can go further, but look at, what, look at verse 15. He has 
the image of the invisible God, the firstborn over all creation. For by him all things were created that are in heaven and that are in earth, visible and invisible, whether thrones or dominions or principalities or powers. All things were created through him and for him, and he is before all things, and in him all things consist. Man's, uh, uh, if we see Paul, what he says right here, man owes allegiance to God as his creator. We created in the image of God, no matter who you are, you're culpable. You even know you're culpable, and you need to worship God and not the creation. But what's wonderful is God sends the creator to redeem us, to deliver us, so now that he might make us right with him. Uh, this, this, this whole text here, I think you folks, maybe it was last winter, I sent you some audio of uh, Dr. Joel Boots, uh, The Marvel and Mystery of Man. That Marvel and Mystery of Man appears in a periodical, but he looks and talks a bit about the, the wonder of God as creator being the one that would deliver us, this connection between <coughs> redemption and God as creator. He says this, this passage crucially links creation and redemption as a unified totality in Jesus Christ, pointing to the ultimate destiny of redeemed humanity in resurrection. <coughs> in fact, in Colossians, Paul affirms that all things in the entire cosmos, visible and invisible, including all powers and authorities, both heavenly and earthly, were created through and for Christ. It's ever so important when we look at the totality of Scripture to take into account creation, fall, redemption, and ultimately consummation. Whenever we're singing about creation, we're kind of singing about these areas and where we're headed and where we are right now. But I think it's cause for us, Christian, to worship God rightly, who has delivered us through his Son. And this is not just a mere man. This was God in the flesh. Not just God in the flesh, but God who created everything for him and for his purposes as well as us. So that's why John in 1 John says this, In the beginning was the Word, and the Word was with God, and the Word was God. He was in the beginning with God. All things were made through him. Without him, nothing is made that was made. Uh, the, the writer of Hebrews says it this way, God, who at various times and various ways spoke in times past to the fathers by the prophets, has in these last days spoken to us by his Son, whom he has appointed heir of all things, through whom also he made the worlds, who being the brightness of his glory, the express image of his person, and upholding all things by the word of his power, when he had by himself purged our sins. So I think Paul has an understanding of that in verse 25 when he says, rather than the creator who is blessed forever, who exchanged the truth of God for the lie and worship and serve the creature rather than the creator. But Paul can see and has been delivered to the truth of God and is able now to worship the creator and to serve him rightly. And it's ever, I think, it's something that's of encouragement to us. Uh, later on in Romans, Paul will say, For of him and through him and to him are all things to whom be glory forever. If you today have been changed by the gospel, you ought to be a worshiping person. You ought to be a person who worships the triune God of the Bible who delivered you. We ought to be those who are serving him with our whole heart, mind, and soul as we've been delivered. But maybe sometimes we fall just like they do, and, and we kind of get our eyes on, the, on, the, on the, the shiny thing, right? We start to look at the creation a little bit. May we be challenged, warned by those who worship the creation and not the creator, and may we be buoyed by the power of the gospel that we might be worshiping people who live and worship God. Those, the, the crux of their problem is that they worship creation, and where does it lead? It leads into all of that destruction that you see there in Romans chapter 1. 
But we as Christians, the opposite is true. Now that we've been delivered, we can walk in righteousness. We're able to be transformed, to live lives that are transformed in this world we live in by the power of the gospel. But what has to be, just as the crux that they've missed, is worshiping creation, at the very foundation of our lives has to be a love for our creator, a desire to worship him. And then we go out and do everything we do as part of our lives. It's always the same thing. People will get distracted, and they begin to worship and love other things more than God. I remember sharing with Diana at her, at her uh, graduation, if she wanted to be successful, she needed to make sure that her treasure, her heart was where her treasure is, and that Christ is her treasure. Jesus makes that very, very clear. He promises he'll take care of all those other things, but you ought to make God your most valuable treasure here on earth. And the shame of it is we're not fully delivered yet from this flesh. We still fight with it, but we don't have to. We can be rightly transformed by the power of the Holy Spirit and live lives in worship to the Creator. Joe Boo, one more time from the marvel and the mystery. We can only know what a human being is when related back to our origin in God who made man in his image. This image is expressed in our ability to know and worship God in our responsibility, which is different from the animals, to represent God in creation. It is from this religious relationship to God that our relationship to the rest of creation and our fellow man finds it me its meaning. You see that? The very meaning of your life has to start there. Then everything else works itself out. We're able to rightly represent God, albeit not perfectly, but better day by day as we are sanctified. So we sang earlier, and you see it in all these songs about creation. Uh, Stuart Townend has that beautiful song there. Creation gazed upon his face, the ageless one in time's embrace, unveiled the Father's plan of reconciling God and man. A second Adam walked the earth, whose blameless life, whose blameless life would break the curse, whose death would set us free to live with him eternally. That beginning has begun. We have been set free in Christ that we might begin to rightly worship God. Now there is a day when consummation comes and we always sing of it, but sometimes I think we jump to the last and to the second coming and miss what we can enjoy now as being recreated in Christ. So he goes on to say, creation longs for his return and we do. We're going to see in Romans that, that all of creation groans under the weight of sin. But this is turned back and turned back ultimately when he comes again to, to establish that new heaven and new earth come out of heaven. And it says, creation longs for his return when Christ shall reign upon the earth. The bitter wars that rage are birth pains of a coming age when he renews the land and sky. All heaven will sing and earth reply with one resplendent theme, the glory of God our King. And we can begin to sing that song now. We can begin to see the power of God, what he has done for us in Christ, that we might live lives that are birthed out of worship. And that worship should spread to all of our lives. Whatever it is, as fathers, as mothers, when we go to work, when we interact with each other, the basis for our connection ought to be first and foremost, worship for God. We ought to be worshiping beings. But God forbid that we fall in to our <coughs> old ways. God forbid that we love anything more than God. God is the gift giver. The problem is sometimes we become enthralled with the gifts. The gifts, though, are not necessarily wrong. God has given us good things. Christ said, I've come that they might have life and have it more abundantly. But God forbid that we would fall into idolatry. Sad thing is we do. But when we do, he promises if we repent, he'll cleanse us afresh. So let's come up and sing this last song. This was a song, All Creation, All Creatures of Our God and King by Fred.
Francis of Assisi. It says Saint Francis of Assisi. I don't know if I can make that delineation. Jesus will make that judge, that judgment. But it's a wonderful song. All creatures of our God and King, lift up your voice and with us sing. We now can worship the living God. All the redeemed, washed by his blood, come and rejoice in his great love. Oh, praise him. Alleluia. Christ has defeated every sin. Cast all your burdens now on him. Oh, praise him. Alleluia. Sometimes I told Michelle I get this Holy Ghost shiver, and I know it's not supposed to be a thing, but sometimes when I think of the wonders of the Lord, I, I, I get a little shiver in my neck or, 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 or um, goose pimples, right? And we should get those kind of goose pimples over what God has done for us in Christ, that we might be truly worshiping people. Let's pray. Father, we thank you that you have delivered us out of darkness into light, that, Lord God, we now can live as your creation, rightly related to you, Father, and right, rightly related to creation, that we might worship the creator who is blessed forever and ever. Father, we, may we be a people that live our lives out of adoration, out of worship, for you, God, who are most worthy and most worth our worship, Father. God, I pray that you might um, continue to draw us, Lord God, even in a world that is given to idolatry, a world that is given at this stage, Lord, to worshiping the creation, and it is de demonstrating itself in so many terrible and wicked ways. But God, may we be those that demonstrate the fruit of the Holy Spirit. All of those things that are a direct relation out of idolatry, Father, may we be those that walk uprightly. May you increasingly help us and empower us to be the type of people that live in worship and demonstrate your great love to the world. Father, we thank you for your word. We thank you for your goodness. In Jesus' name, amen.